Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this virtual event with Professor Rachel Martin. Um, my name is James Bullock. I'm the Dean of the School of Physical Sciences here at UCI. And this is the first of what will probably be a, um, several virtual events like this where we uh, invite uh, friends and people in the community to join us virtually to hear about exciting research we're doing in the school and efforts related to COVID-19. Um, we couldn't have a better person to kick off this event than Professor Rachel Martin, who's leading a very interesting study among actually many uh, faculty in the, in the chemistry department and involving colleagues around the world uh, to work on an antiviral for COVID-19. Um, it's been exciting in physical sciences recently uh, to uh, participate um, or at least sort of witness what's the response among a lot of our faculty. We have physicists who are working on techniques of using UV light to quickly and cheaply sterilize surfaces. Uh, we have biochemists working on new ideas for very quick uh, antibody tests. And we have aerosol chemists working on new ideas, ideas for masks. Um, normally what we do, that we're doing this seminar or this uh, virtual event in place of, of what we have been doing in the past called the Discover the Physical Sciences Breakfast Series. And we have a text to give number that we often invite people to use if they want to support that effort. And it's given, it was given on the first slide and, and the number is 41444. And if you text PSBLS to that number, you can uh, donate to help support the event. And what we've decided to do is to turn all of those donations over to the scientific effort that Rachel will be talking about today. So if you want to support this effort, um, please feel free to text to that number, or you can send me an email or, or drop an email to the school, uh, and we can figure out a way to get those funds to Rachel to help her do what she's doing. One thing she probably will explain later today is that um, it's not easy to sort of immediately turn on a dime and start a research program because the funding cycle for places like the NSF can take up to a year. So you put a proposal in, it's reviewed, there's a big cycle back and forth, and then finally the funds arrive. So it's very difficult to turn on a dime and start working on something this urgently. And so any help you can offer would be fantastic. We have diverted some of the Dean's funds already to try to help Rachel get going here, but any little bit will help to say buy chemicals, et cetera, and she may elaborate on that later. Um, but for now, we're happy you joined. Uh, Rachel Martin got her PhD at Yale in 2002. She became an assistant professor at UCI in 2005. Uh, not too long after that, she won an NSF Career Award, which is a big deal. And she's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, she studies structure function of proteins and has worked on a wide variety of very interesting questions related to, to proteins, including the origin of life and various ways to cure disease. But today, of course, we're going to hear about her efforts, a uh, new effort uh, focusing on COVID-19. So with that, um, I will let Rachel take over. Let me just mention that we have a Q&A box down there, and you're free to type questions in that box. What we'll probably do is when Rachel ends her talk in about 45 minutes, I will then relay to her questions that come in through those boxes, th through those virtual questions, and then she can answer them for everyone. So. With that, let me begin. Uh, welcome, Rachel. Thank you, James, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm really happy to be able to contribute to solving this problem that we're all facing and to have the opportunity to tell you about our, some of our work today. So today I'm going to talk to you about some work that I've been doing with a really large consortium involving a bunch of people from UCI and also from all over the world. And this has been an absolutely unique experience for me. Normally, if you wanted to start a big collaboration with a whole bunch of research groups, it would take a really long time. It's uh, something that, you know, usually there's a lot of planning and a lot of back and forth as far as what the roles of the different groups are going to be. And in this case, we have put this thing together in about six weeks. This, um, we started, I would say March 15th was, was the beginning of this project. 
And it's been really inspiring to me to see how scientists you know, at UCI and all over the world have come together to work on this problem. Okay, so this talk is gonna be in three parts. First, I'm gonna go over some of the coronavirus basics and you know, what, how does SARS-CoV-2 work? Why did we pick the particular target that we did to inhibit it? And then I will go into some more detail about the particular enzyme that we want to inhibit, and then finally talk about our results so far toward the, those efforts. So to start, I want to talk about what a coronavirus is. So this is a type of virus that has an RNA genome, and it's single-stranded and positive sense. I'll get what that, I'll get into what that means exactly in a minute. It's also enclosed in a membrane. And that's really important in terms of some of the advice that, that we've been hearing to you know, wash your hands a lot and disinfect everything because soap and water disrupts that membrane envelope and makes it impossible for the, the coronavirus to replicate. And the corona is made up of glycoprotein spikes that protrude from the membrane. And here are some artistic depictions of, of how that works. We have the membrane with the, the various proteins projecting out of it and then the RNA genome in the middle. I want to say a little bit about how this pandemic started because that's relevant to some of our efforts for inhibitor design and you know, what we want to do to be prepared for similar events in the future. So it first emerged in Wuhan in late 2019, and its origin is from a bat coronavirus that jump species and first it infected a pangolin and recombined with a pangolin coronavirus in an animal that was infected with with both viruses and because of that recombination it developed some modifications that made it easier for this virus to infect humans and it's very similar to the first SARS virus and also MERS but it's not a direct descendant of either it's something that that arose independently from an animal source If we look at the genome organization of this virus, and this is just a, a schematic to see how it works, we can see that it has very few genes compared to a, a living creature. You know, even a, even a prokaryote has, has many, many more genes than this. And they're organized into one large open reading frame at the beginning, and then there are several smaller ones. And the part that we're going to focus on today is it's NSP5, non-structural protein 5, and that is the main protease, or mpro for short. And here's where it resides in the genome. And I want to tell you about the, the role that this protease plays in, virus repli in viral replication. So in order to understand that, first we have to talk about how proteins get produced in a healthy cell. So the way that works is we have the genes for producing protein in the, encoded in the DNA, in, which is in the nucleus. And then DNA gets transcribed to messenger RNA, which is the, it's like the instructions for, for making a protein. And then those messages come out of the nucleus and they go to the ribosome. The ribosome is like a little 3D printer for making functional proteins. So it makes, it makes enzymes, it makes all of the structural proteins that our cells need. And there are some particular features of the eukaryotic mRNA that enable the ribosome to recognize it and understand that that RNA is supposed to be translated to make a protein. So it has a five prime cap. We've drawn this as a little, a little knob that's like a handle for the ribosome to grab onto. It tells it start here and start making this protein. And so when that happens in a, in a eukaryotic cell, this is going on in the cytoplasm. Our little 3D printer is going along and cranking out the protein. And they're usually made one at a time, um, not always, but, but usually. And that's how it, it works in, in the ordinary case. Now what happens when the cell is infected with a coronavirus? So the virus here is, is entering the cell and it's uh, it, it enters by interacting with the ACE2 receptor and undergoing membrane fusion. And then once that virus gets into the cell, it releases its, MR, its genome, which looks to your cell just like a mammalian mRNA. You know, it mimics 
some of these cues that the ribosome uses to tell it to grab onto that thing and, and use it to, to make protein. There are some important differences though. So one thing is the, the virus doesn't have very many genes. Remember I showed you that, that picture where it has very few genes. It only makes about 29 proteins. The rest of what it does, it depends on the host cell to do for it. And so, you know, since a, a virus doesn't have very many resources, it can't afford a you know, bespoke mRNA for every protein. Instead, what it has is a long polyprotein chain. So the ribosome translates all of those proteins all at once, and then they have to get cut up to make the functional protein. And the enzyme that does the cutting up is this viral main protease. And that's going to be our target, because if we can stop that from cutting up the polyprotein, then the virus won't be able to replicate. Instead, it'll just be left with this long chain of, of viral polyprotein that doesn't do anything and eventually the, the cleanup machinery of our own cells will, will take care of it and degrade it. So that's our objective for how we're actually going to inhibit viral replication. And I wanna point out that this strategy is something that has been used very successfully for HIV. This is, protease inhibitors are the class of drugs that have really played a, real, a big role in making HIV into a manageable chronic disease rather than an inevitably fatal one. The details are very different because the, the, there, it's, there are di very different types of viruses and their proteases are different enzyme classes, but we can learn from the same general strategy that was used. So that's, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, so in order to talk about the main protease and how we're going to inhibit it and how all of these things work, I need to tell you a little bit about protein structures. So here's what a protein structure looks like. This is based on experimental data. If we solve a structure using NMR spectroscopy or cryo-EM or crystallography, we get three-dimensional coordinates for every single atom in the protein. And as you can see, it's really complicated. And it's hard to look at a structure like this that's, that's representing every atom and be able to see the patterns and understand what that structure is doing. And so we have some shorthand notation that we use to get, you know, to, uh, to simplify things a little bit. So you notice there are some patterns in how the protein chain curves around here in a helix. And then over here, there are some long extended regions. And we draw those as, as ribbons representing the hydrogen bonding pattern. So we have alpha helices over here, we have some beta sheets over there. And then a lot of times, if we're just looking at the overall structure, having all the amino acid side chains drawn in makes the picture confusing, and so we leave them out. So I'm gonna show a lot of ribbon structures that look like this. And I just want you to remember that there's a lot of experimental data behind that. We actually do know where for the most part, where all the atoms are in space, but we're leaving them out for clarity. And I also want to say that a lot of the, the beautiful protein renderings that you're going to see are, were done by the students in my group. Vesta and Fatime worked really hard on some of these pictures. So fortunately, there are some structures available of MPRO that we can use to get started. There, there are several of them out by now, actually. This is, this is one of the first that I was aware of. And we're using their structure as a starting point for some of our experiments. So here it's drawn as you know, the ribbon structure. I'm also showing the space filling model of the surface. So you can get an idea of how this thing takes up space. So all of the amino acid side chains are here you know, taking up this, this space in the surface. And what we're looking at in the middle is the actual enzyme active site. So it has an active cysteine and histidine residue that do the actual chemistry, and I'll show how that works in a minute. And then all of these other residues around that are drawn in in different colors are amino acids that are not directly involved in the chemistry of the, acid, of the active site, but they're adjacent to it, and they're relevant to how the protein binds its substrate. And that's going to be really important. One of the reasons that MPRO is an attractive target for us is that it's very specific about what substrates it cuts up. And there are not any human proteases that cleave the substrate in exactly the same way. And that's really important because it means that if we make a drug that can inhibit this protein, it's less likely to have bad side effects because it's not also inhibiting a human protein that, that we need to function. 
Okay, so if we look at the, these active site residues, we have the, the mechanism here. This is for the, uh, the aficionados in, in chemistry, but I'll just briefly say what it does. So this cysteine residue is actually going to attack the backbone of the substrate protein, and then it's stabilized, the, the intermediate is stabilized by this protonated histidine, and then we have some proton transfers. And the take home message is that a molecule of water gets added across that protein backbone. So we have our peptide of the substrate, and then hydrogen is gonna get stuck on one side and an OH group gets stuck on the other, and then the backbone cleaves and floats away off into solution and the substrate protein is now degraded. So in the context of the, the virus, that's how our functional polyprotein is getting cut up. There are a lot of different proteases in the cell that are used for, for different functions, digestion of food, housekeeping, you know, cleaning up old proteins that aren't needed anymore. And there are several different mechanisms that, that they can use. This is the one that, that we're gonna focus on. So I mentioned protein specificity a little bit, when that's, and that's something that's, that's really important to this project. There are a lot of variations in how specific different proteases are. So I'm showing here an example of papain. This is a protein that's um, it's in, it's found in papayas. The papaya plant is making that enzyme to deter insects from eating the fruit. Because if you're a, if you're a papaya plant, what you really want is for a, a large mammal to eat the fruit and take, you know, carry that large seed somewhere else where the, it can be planted. And having insects destroy the fruit will make the, the seed just drop on the ground and, and not get dispersed. So it's making cysteine proteases in order to deter those, those insects. And if you've ever eaten a papaya or a kiwi fruit or some of these other kinds of fruit and you feel kind of a, a piquant sensation in your mouth, that's actually the proteases working on the, the tissue. So a protease like this that's being used as a, as a general defensive function is very, very general. So we can think about this in terms of our analogy of a pair of scissors. So this is just you know, a nice pair of big, sharp scissors that can cut up any kind of protein. And again, here's our active site residue. Here's the active cysteine and active histidine. And we can see that this active site cleft where the substrate goes is pretty big and it's wide open. There's not a lot to block any kind of protein from getting in here. So papain is a really general cysteine protease that can cut up just about any protein that gets thrown in there. Now let's look at some examples. And again, these are from plants. They're ones that, that, uh, that my group and my collaborators have worked on before. If we look at some other examples that are more specific, we can see exactly how that works. So again, here's our, our protein structure, and here's that active site cleft. But now, instead of having that, that cleft wide open so that any old substrate can go in there, we actually have some key structural elements that are partially blocking it. And here, the, the, blue, the blue and the green are different cysteine proteases from a plant. The gray one is cathepsin H, that's actually a, a human protease. And you can see that you know, this active site is partially blocked. If we look at it this way, it looks like nothing could go in there at all. But if we turn it around, and this picture is the same as this one, just rotate it around, then we can see that, okay, the active site cleft is partially open, but we get some specificity from what's blocking it. And if we go back to our analogy for scissors, we can think about scissors for different kinds of things. So we, have, we can have embroidery scissors or medical scissors or hair cutting scissors, and they all have different purposes. And so, you know, some of these things are just a lot more specific than others. And as I mentioned, MPRO, like most viral proteases, is actually very specific. And so that makes it a really good target to inhibit. Because what we wouldn't want is for our protease inhibitor to be completely general and mess up, you know, cathepsin H, which is something that is a, it's a housekeeping protein that our cells need to, you know, to stay, to remove protein aggregates and stay healthy. Let's take a look at one of the first inhibitors for MPRO that was developed. And this, you know, this was not done at UCI. This is uh, some work that, that came out of uh, this group. Um, I want to show you some key features of this type of inhibitor. So here we're looking at the 
the MPRO structure again. And one thing I didn't say before is that this protease is actually most active as a dimer. I've been showing you the monomer, so just one copy of the protein. But when it's actually doing its job, it goes in pairs. So that's so that's so we we have this dimer here. The the black one is in front, and then the one that's gray is rendered in the back. So it's it looks like this. There, there two of these proteins are are linked together, and that's its active state. And so we have the structure of the protein bound to one of the first inhibitors that was developed. And I want to show you some features of this thing that make it a good inhibitor. So one thing that you might notice is that it looks like a peptide. So we have you know, these, these peptide functionalities that enables the, the protein to grab onto it. it. It recognizes that as a substrate. But then if you look over here, it has an oxygen in place of a nitrogen in the backbone here. So the protein can't cleave that bond. So the substrate is gonna bind, but then the chemistry can't happen. And then furthermore, we have this double bond here, which is an electron pore group that can react with that active cysteine and block it up. So this inhibitor behaves like a peptide. So the protein will, will bind it as though it's the substrate, but then it can't cleave it and then it has a group that actually locks onto the active site residue and permanently inactivates it. So that's, that's a really good strategy. That's, uh, that's similar to some of the things that, that we're going to be working on. The key is we need to, first of all, we need to not have only one drug. Um, one of the main issues with, with uh, antiviral drugs is that viruses mutate. And so we need more than one solution. And also, this thing is a really promising start, but we, I think we can develop some better drugs that, that might be more useful. And it's going to take groups all over the world to do this. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of the tools that we use in order to develop our inhibitors. So one important tool is molecular dynamics simulations. So Instead of just going into the lab and doing a bunch of experiments right away, we think it's really important to simulate these proteins and understand how they work and design our inhibitors very carefully before actually going into the lab. At this point, we can only have a really limited number of people in the lab and reagents are expensive and we want to make sure that we're, that we're working on the, you know, the very best molecules that we have. And so in order to do that, we need these simulations to tell us about what's going to work well, how does the protein behave? And so we have various groups working on molecular dynamic simulations. Carter Butts did these, Doug Tobias's group is also working on MD simulations. And so here you see the protein moving around within its shell of water. And you know, it may not be obvious, but one of the things that makes these MD simulations hard to run or you know, take a, long t a lot of computer time is that you have to simulate this huge water box so it kind of looks like you know, water in a glass, but every single water molecule is actually specified and it's being simulated in this picture. And so that helps give us an idea of how the protein is working, how it interacts with its substrate and its environment. So Rachel, I'm gonna show you some simulations from the Tobias lab. Rachel? Yes. Um, I'm going to interject with a question just because I think it will help with the flow and help people follow along with what you're doing, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so we have a question which is sort of specific, but I think it might be helpful. The question is, is Impro active as a monomer? And then if not, can you inhibit the activity by disrupting dimerization? That is a really great idea. And it's actually something that, that we're working on. So um, it is minimally active as a monomer, but it doesn't work very well. It's, uh, it, really, it really does its job best as a dimer. And th that's a, it is a really good point. So today I'm mostly going to talk to you about inhibitors that block the active site, but we are also working on inhibitors that, that interrupt dimerization. So Mega and Helkar in my group is working on trying to find places that, uh, where the protein absolutely can't tolerate having something bind and still form a dimer. That's a great question. Okay, so as we go forward, I'm going to kind of switch back and forth between the, the, the monomer and the dimer structure. So that's, 
just to keep you oriented about how that that goes together here it's you know we have these different parts of the protein color coded and the active site residues are drawn in so that you can see where they are okay so for some of these md simulations well all of them really we're starting with that that crystal structure from gene et al so if we start with that crystal structure and then simulate the protein and see how it moves around, that can give us a lot of information about the conformations that mPro can adopt. One thing that we have to be really careful about when we're designing inhibitors is that we don't want to design our inhibitor to bind to only one conformation. So if you get something that's in a crystal structure, you know, they're, they're beautiful and they tell you a lot about the, the molecular details of the protein, but it's a snapshot the protein is frozen in that crystal. And that's not how it behaves in solution. You saw in our simulation how it's jiggling all around and it, it moves a lot. And that's definitely relevant to enzyme function that, that we have to worry about different conformations. And so we need these MD simulations to tell us about the different conformations that we might be able to inhibit. So this work is done by Alfredo Freitas and Doug Tobias. They're using Anton, which is a supercomputer and running really long trajectories of mPro in order to tell us about the different kinds of conformations that it can adopt. And so here what we're looking at, these, uh, these plots are just telling us about the distance between those two active site residues. And that's a really good proxy for what's going on with the protein if we just want to take a simple measure, because if the active site residues aren't close enough to each other, they're not going to be able to do the chemistry. And so we, we need to see sort of what kinds of conformations this thing can adopt and can we maybe shove something in there. So you can think of it as like it has a, it's, it's like a Pac-Man, it has a mouth. And if we can shove something in the mouth when it's wide open, then it's not going to be able to, to cleave proteins and do its job. So if we look at these, these trajectories, this one is for the monomer. And so we can see that that, you know, that goes along and it kind of opens right up and flops around. So in this case, the, the mouth is just staying open. That gives us some information about why it's not very active as a, as a monomer, right? Because it's, it's in this, it stays in this conformation where it's just open and it's not, uh, it's not able to do very much. Whereas if we look at the, the structures for the dimer, one thing that we notice is that the two molecules in the dimer, here they're called A and B, they actually behave pretty differently. So we think that only one is actually active at a time. So if we look at dimer A in red, that's mostly just staying closed. And we think it's just holding the structure together. Whereas, um, sorry, dimer B is the one that's closed. Dimer A in black undergoes these periods where it's, where it's open. And you know it's important to have these long trajectories because you know it takes it takes a while to actually be able to see this, and so that's where the the supercomputer time comes in. And also, it seems to be really important that we have to be able to switch back and forth between the different conformations. Another thing I want to point out is the difference between how this protein behaves at room temperature versus at body temperature. So at room temperature, we occasionally see these other states being explored, but not very much. It looks like the enzyme isn't very active here. But if we heat it up to body temperature, then we can see that these other states are, are coming up quite a bit more. So now let's look at what these things actually look like. So here I'm just showing you a distance, and that tells you something, but it doesn't give us a very good idea of what the conformations are like. If we actually take a snapshot from each of those places in the MD simulation. Here are some of the conformations that we see from different points in this trajectory. So if we look at that distance, you know, we can see that there are fluctuations. There are kind of three main states. We have closed and semi-open and open. But again, the details of what they actually look like are pretty different. And so now, thanks to this long simulation that Doug and Alfredo have done, we have a really good idea of what's the conformational space that's available to mPro, and we can design our inhibitors against that whole range of conformations that the enzyme adopts, rather than just the crystal structure. Another question? Very quickly, I just wanted to actually make a comment, just so everyone understands the context a little bit. Um, 
the the effort that Rachel's describing is this really kind of amazing collaboration among many chemists in the chemistry department. And uh, this is not a usual thing, you know. Um, and so people have rallied together. I just want to mention, you know, Doug Tobias is the chair of the, the chemistry department, and he is chipping in his expertise as a simulator to help Rachel with this effort. Um, so if you're not familiar with the names, a lot of the names she's mentioning are sort of active and, and sort of, you know, uh, PIs within the chemistry department that have their own programs, and, and many of them are all sort of chipping in uh, to work on this effort. So I thought I would just provide that context a little bit in case people weren't familiar with the names. Thank you. So yeah, so, so thanks to this wonderful simulation effort, we can see some of the different conformations that this protein can adopt, and we get a better idea of kind of what the dynamics of the active site look like. In some ways, MPRO is a pretty weird enzyme because it's, you know, as I mentioned, it's very specific, but its active site is actually kind of big and floppy compared to some other proteases that are, that are very specific. So understanding how that works is going to be a really important part of our inhibitor design, and we need the, the simulations to, to do that. All right, so that's what we're doing in terms of the looking at the conformations that a particular MPRO molecule or a particular dimer can adopt. Now, what about mutation? So I mentioned that one of the big challenges for developing antiviral agents is that viruses mutate. Now, this virus doesn't mutate very fast on the grand scale of viruses mutating quickly. It has some proofreading functionality in its genome, so it's able to, to keep more integrity in the information. But still, we're tracking every mutation in the genome as they, as they come in. They're being measured from patients that are tested around the world, and we're, we're tracking this every day. And every day, we see about two different mutations in MPRO. So mutation is something that we have to worry about. And Carter Butts and I have had a, a longstanding project involving using these kinds of simulation techniques to make use of the ever bigger data that comes from genome sequences. And in the original context of this project, we weren't thinking about drug design. We weren't thinking about mutations necessarily. We were interested in looking at enzymes from natural sources that could be used for technological or, or chemical biology tools. And we're interested in doing a lot of the, the pre-work in simulation before we actually make these enzymes and test them. So just for some context, if we, if we forget about mutation for a second and think about the different enzymes that, that have been discovered, the base count in the NCBI database, that's where, that's where all genomes get deposited, that doubles every 18 months. And this is really amazing to me as kind of a child of the bio-revolution. When I was in grad school, the entire world was working on the Human Genome Project. This was, you know, this was a big effort that everybody was spending all their time on. And because of the success of that project, now we have really quick sequencing. And you can sequence genomes very, very rapidly and dump all of these and all of these uh, sequences into databases and provide that information. But the problem is we have all these amazing enzymes that have been discovered in principle, but it's actually just a sequence in a database. We don't know what they do. And we can't just make all of them and look at it because you know the cost of expressing one protein in the lab so that we can study it is anywhere from you know a thousand dollars to a few thousand dollars per protein. And that's when it works right away. And you need a, a graduate student to do that, and it takes up a lot of time. And so if we start thinking about numbers like this, then we just can't possibly make all of those enzymes. It's just too expensive, and, and you can't do it. The same is true for mutation. Again, I mentioned that we developed this strategy for looking at cysteine proteases in plants. These are the cysteine proteases that we discovered from a carnivorous plant, Drosera capensis. And here's, here's just one example of these. And so I put this up here to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. So we want to discover new proteases that have different functionality and that we can use in proteomics and to cut up amyloid fibrils and other, protein re or other protease resistant aggregates. But this plant, alone has 44 new cysteine proteases. 
And remember that, you know, $1,000 to a few thousand dollars per protein and a grad student has to spend time on it. We can't afford to make them all. And so what we're interested in doing is developing an in silico pipeline where we can test for a lot of the activities in the computer before deciding what to spend our energy on. So that's what we were working on before the pandemic started, but we pretty quickly realized that we can adapt the strategy to address mutations and use it as a, as a drug discovery platform. So in order to do that, we have to keep track of the mutations. And so, as I mentioned, we're doing that every day. And by me, I mean these people. So this is TJ Cross. He is a third year chemistry undergrad. He joined my lab somewhere around March 13th. On March 15th, we started doing this. He's working from home. Um, he's had to learn a huge amount of bioinformatics and coding and all sorts of stuff. Um, Gemma Takahashi is also working on this. She's a, a first year graduate student. And what TJ and Gemma are doing is they're pulling every mutation in MPRO from the, the worldwide database of patients that have been tested every day. And then those sequences go right into our modeling pipeline so that we can simulate them and try to understand how the mutations affect functionality. So this is a tree that shows the relationship in terms of the genomes. And then the actual MPRO mutations are pulled out here. And here's our pangolin and bat sequences just for reference. And then we have some, there are some more mutations down here that, that uh, where the labels didn't fit in the picture. So it's kind of interesting. We can look at the data in terms of the geographical region. We can look at the different kinds of mutations that there are. The geographical data should be taken with a grain of salt because you know, it might look like there are some trends in terms of what kinds of mutations are happening where in the planet. I think at this point that is really dominated by rates of testing because there isn't a lot of testing going on compared to where we need to be and it's very uneven in different places in the world. So we, you know, we don't we don't have as many sequences as we would need to be able to say anything about those geographically. But chemically, we can really use that information to to tell us a lot about how these things work. So what we're looking at here is a network of substitutions among amino acids. So here the amino acids are represented by their one letter codes. And if there's an arrow moving from one amino acid to another, that means that in this case, alanine was replaced with valine. And the thickness of the arrows tells you about how many times it happened. So we know that alanine gets replaced with valine a lot and it hardly ever goes back the other way. And if we look at some of these big hydrophobic amino acids, here's leucine, that's another big hydrophobic amino acid, that only has incoming ties, except sometimes it gets replaced with phenylalanine. And if we look at this trend overall, we see that there is motion in general toward larger and more hydrophobic amino acids being selected for. What does that mean? We're not entirely sure yet, but it is, it is very clear from the data. And so this, I wanna point out that the, the tree that I showed you before was from the April 14th data set. This is from the April 29th data set, which has 77 unique mutations. Here on the structure, I'm showing where are the residues that were mutated. And you can see that they're all over the protein. We have mutations in, in all kinds of different places on the protein structure. I should mention that <clears throat> here I'm showing the dimer. The black one doesn't have any of the mutations drawn in. It's just for reference. You can see where the active site is. And then the gray one does show where the mutations are. The active site residues are, are never mutated, which makes sense because you know, this isn't a random sample. We're looking at clinically relevant variants. So the only MPRO sequences that we're going to see are the ones that were functional enough for the virus to infect somebody and show up in, in that testing. So we don't have any mutations in the active site, but to return to somebody's question earlier, we also don't have any mutations in the dimerization interface. And so that gives us some really important clues about exactly where do we need some inhibitors to bind in order to block dimerization. So this is one way that we can data. We can also make networks of the proteins themselves. And we do that using some methodology developed by Valerie Daggett and her group at the University of Washington. 
And so in this case, instead of having the nodes be amino acids, the nodes are chemical groups that are subsets of the amino acids. So here we have a group that's polar, we have some hydrophobic components, we have something that's positively charged. And I'm gonna show you some networks where we look at how those different chemical groups relate to each other in space. So these are active site networks where we take the nodes are those different chemical groups in the active site residues, as well as the residues immediately around them. So this is a it's kind of a measure of that, that binding box where the substrate is going to interact with the protein. And the ties between them represent those groups being close enough in space to touch in our MD simulations that we're running every single day of all of those mutations. And so we can, we can use that kind of network to generate a constraint score that tells us about the flexibility of the active site. And here I'm showing you the most flexible active site and the least flexible active site in our data set. And then here's what those conformations actually look like. So there's a lot of data here. The take home message is we can use these kind of representations to learn a lot about how flexible the active site is and what kinds of conformations that we're able to sample. So just like I talked about with the MD simulations of the wild type protein, we can use this data to tell us about the, the conformational space of the whole mutational landscape of the protein, which is what we really need to design inhibitors against. And of course, more mutations are going to come along as time goes by and we have to try to keep up with it, but that's, that's how it works. So the next step here, at least in the simulation part, is to dock inhibitors against all of these conformations. And so here's what that looks like for a set of inhibitors. The, the blue, this is an MPRO monomer. The blue region shows the binding box. That's where our, in, our inhibitors and substrates can bind. And then we have a whole bunch of small molecules that are possible drug candidates bound. Now, this picture is just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Of course, we wouldn't use all of them at once. We might use a few of them at once, but, but not, not this many. But that shows you the whole wide range of places that potential inhibitors can bind in the box. And Liz Diesner and Zixiao Song have been really working hard on getting the docking to work. And a whole bunch of undergraduates in my group who are working from home, Ashley, Elliot, Allison, Sophia, Ponies, and Quinn, they're all working from home. And they are getting these inhibitors into a format where we can use them in the simulations. And that's harder than it sounds because we're getting absolutely enormous numbers of these things as candidates. And sometimes we just get a two-dimensional structure, you know, drawn in ChemDraw. Sometimes we just get a text string that describes how the, the atoms fit together. And we have to make that into a model that can actually be docked against the protein. And so they are all doing this. And Amberly Sanford from the Jarbo group has been checking those structures to see if they're chemically reasonable. Because of course, you can't do all of this by hand. You have to have some scripts to do it. And sometimes there are some, some errors and we need and a synthetic chemist to look at them and make sure that, that they're okay. All right, just to give an idea of the scale of this, you know, we're looking at basically all the compounds in drug bank. We have the UCI synthetic chemistry library. So, you know, more or less every molecule that's ever been synthesized at UCI. We also have collaborators from all over the world who are giving us these libraries. So, you know, recently we got 70,000 compounds from an institute in Norway and I emailed Liz and said, okay, here's your 70,000 compounds. And then, you know, everybody had to scramble to, to get these things ready to model. We're getting a bunch of them from the FMP in Berlin. So this is really a, a huge effort. Okay, so that's, that's what, what we're doing on the modeling side. And that really enables us to make a plan, use our resources wisely in the lab. Now let's talk about what we do when we actually get into the lab. So a lot of people have asked questions about how do we work in the lab given that we need to maintain physical distancing and stay safe. And of course, that's, that's the main priority. It took us, we were shut down for about a week. And during that week, we were not only planning our experiments, but also figuring out how are we going to work safely. And so everybody who's in the lab needs to stay at least six feet away from each other. And 
you know, people are bad at estimating distance and it's also really hard to remember. So we made markings on the floor to make sure that everybody remembers to do it. This is one of the things that's been really challenging. I mean, so normally we would have, you know, eight or 10 people working in the lab and right now we can only have two. And also it's been really hard for us. So the stereotype of a lab scientist is, you know, some old guy that's socially maladjusted and doesn't have any friends, but that's not how it works at all. Experimentalists are very social. Usually we're, you know, we're all in there in large groups and, you know, it's, we're used to having a bunch of people around that you can ask for, for ideas and talk to about how different experiments are going. And so that, that has been a big adjustment. The most important thing is safety. So we, you know, we are doing it, but it's been something that's, uh, that's hard for us to deal with. Okay, so as far as what we're actually doing, one of the first things that we need is an, a substrate analog that will tell us whether our inhibitors are working. And that's being developed by the NOAC lab. So Adam and Mai are, are working on this. What our fluorescent substrate analog looks like is, so it just looks like a peptide. So it mimics the MPRO substrate, but it also has a fluorophore and it has a quencher. And so it's like a light bulb with a cover on it. And then when the enzyme cuts that substrate, the fluorophore and the quencher come apart. So it's like taking the cover off the light bulb and it lights up. So we can see that the enzyme is working. And of course, in the real experiments, that's what we don't want. We wanna see this get inhibited. And having a fluorescent assay like this is really important because we need to be able to test the activity for a whole bunch of compounds all at once in a little plate reader so that it doesn't take up too much space or too much time. So that's something that the NOAC lab is, is currently developing. We're also working on inhibitor design. Again, this is one that was developed by the NOAC lab. So we have our normal peptide substrate, and then they're working on making mimics of it that will bind to the active site, but again, not do the chemistry, either just sit there and block it up or permanently bind to it and inactivate the enzyme. We're also working on this with the Dongs lab and several others. This just shows another strategy for making cyclic peptides. So in this case, we're taking our inhibitor that behaves like a normal peptide and cyclizing it. That makes it easier for the inhibitor to get into cells. It makes it more robust and it locks it into a particular conformation so that it's easier for mPro to grab it. And so it doesn't waste time on unpredictive collisions where it's just flopping all around. And another thing that the Dong Lab is doing is they're synthesizing the, the first inhibitor that was made, the one that I showed very early on from the Nature paper, so that we'll have a positive control, so that we, we can test our inhibitors against that. So all of this stuff is going on in the lab, along with the people in my lab who are expressing the MPRO protein and characterizing it biophysically. Okay, so I need to acknowledge a whole bunch of people. So first of all, I need to acknowledge my group. Um, this is an absolutely wonderful, talented group of students. Other than my family, these are the most people, the important people in the world to me. And they've been absolutely amazing in working on this project. None of us knew this protein existed two months ago, and now we're making it and designing inhibitors and pulling all these variants every day. And it's just been an amazing effort by the whole group. And I also want to thank um, James for some, some seed funny, for some seed funding to start this up, and also our program officers from our normal project, Humam, Lindsay, Pedro, and Steve, for you know, being understanding that basically everybody switched all their lab work to, to work on this problem. I need to thank my UCI collaborators. So I talked about some of their work today. Carter, James, Doug, and V. I didn't have time to talk about any of the work by Liz, Andy, Jen, and then Dima and Ben, who run the laser labs and the mass spec facility, which are supporting this effort. And then also the rest of my collaborators from all over the world. These are people that have been very generous with sharing ideas, unpublished data, reagents, resources, magnet time, everything. It's been a really amazing experience. So thank you to my group and all the collaborators and thank you all for coming.
Rachel, thank you so much for that. Um, really inspiring and, um, you know, best of luck to you with all of this. We've got a number of questions. Um, with this slide up, I'll just remind everyone, there's a text to give number if you want to support this research. Um, let me tell you that it would be very useful. Um, you know, as I was saying, you know, she's buying chemicals. They're, you know, a huge group of students were trying to figure out how to support um, their efforts through this. So any little bit will help. And as I've said, we're directing all donations directly to this research effort, and uh, which is something we've never done before with this series. Um, let me ask one question before I get into the some some from the attendees. Can you describe this effort sort of uh, in advantages you think you might have because you're on a campus like UCI and you have chemists and you're talking to biologists and you're close to the medical center? Um, do you think that that, you know, describe that in the context of sort of the global effort and how valuable it is to have those, those kind of colleagues nearby? Oh, yeah, that's, that's been absolutely great because, and, it, and it's, it's just essential to being able to get any of this done. So, you know, Doug and Carter and I have had this long-standing collaboration where we have a, the interplay between the modeling and the experiments. But in terms of actually making those inhibitors, you know, I'm an expert on proteins and, you know, we make proteins and characterize them all the time, but all of those small molecule inhibitors, I would have no idea how to make if we had to do it in my lab. And I don't have to worry about it at all because there are all these wonderful chemists who are in this in the same building who are able to make different kinds of inhibitors. And you know, I didn't have a chance to talk about all of their work, but one of the, the great strengths of this project, I think, is that the synthetic chemists all have different strengths and different molecules that they're able to build. And we can try them all because we have so many people working on it. So that's that's been absolutely wonderful. And it's been great to have the support of the school and the facilities that we need to be able to get the stuff working and do it very fast. Do you see these inhibitors as being delivered? Are they gonna, is this gonna be orally or nasally? How is this gonna work ultimately in the end? Do you have a sense of that? Um, that is absolutely not my problem. So our plan here is, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to develop these inhibitors on up to the level of working in the laboratory assays and also the NOAC lab and the pressure lab can can do these kinds of assays in cell culture. But then after that, we're going to need additional collaborators from the medical school. And, you know, we haven't really explored that yet just because we're at such an early stage, but I do have some people that I that I can talk to when we get to that point. So, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, that is beyond my expertise, and we're going to have to depend on collaborators at the med school to help us with that when we get there. Great. There are a couple of questions along those lines, and I'll just sort of, you know, say it again that that the plan at this point is Rachel knows a lot of people in the medical uh, on medical campus and this at UCI, and also at Applied Innovation, um, where we might have, you know, eventually partner with biotech companies to produce stuff in mass. So. That's down, the, that's down the road, but the nice thing is we have a lot of friends. Uh, the campus is very yeah. big. And I mean, so, that it, in, it is really important, and, and I know that drug delivery is, you know, is often one of the most important things. It's just um, that's going to have to be passed on down the line. That's also another reason why we're exploring so many different avenues, because if one of our drugs turns out to not work for reasons of delivery issues, hopefully one of the other ones will. Um, another question is, are there national supercomputer resources being used in this research? So not yet. So I believe that um, the theory group has put in a proposal to, to do that. They are using Anton, which is great. We're using a bunch of resources at UCI. Um, we have some possible connections to Intel. But yeah, at this point, the, the national resources have not, uh, have not been involved in this effort. Doug Tobias told me very recently that they just got a bunch of time that I think they're gonna, he intends to use for your project. So I, Great. So maybe that's somewhat new. I think we, I think he told me yesterday. Um, yeah, that's, then that's new. I, I didn't know about that. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, so here's a question that I think we talked about before. Uh, so I'll ask this one. Um, if, if the, if the, if the confirmation of MPRO changes with temperature, as you've 
you've shown, um, do you have a sense of what it would look like when the body has a fever? Um, do you think that that will matter as well? So we haven't actually done that. I mean, so those, those Anton simulations are, you know, they're really, really long for a protein. So, so to do it at a different temperature is, is an undertaking. Um, I can tell you in general terms what would probably happen. As you warm up a protein, usually it moves a lot more. And so if the body has a fever, the temperature is, is raised up, then the protein is going to be more dynamic and it will explore more different conformations. So that would be definitely something that would be interesting to look at as we move forward. Great. Um, I'll just mention uh, a couple of people have asked, um, are, are we going to post the, this somewhere else and then people go to watch it later? The answer is yes. So we are going to distribute this and we'll try to even make the slides available separately so everyone can, can take a look at it. Um, let's see. Um, let's see another more specific question. Uh, so in, in these MD simulations, um, is this pure water and how does the ionic content of the water, how, how, will, that, how will that change things? So that I would have to send to my MD collaborators. It's, um, so they, they try to mimic the intracellular concentration as well as, we, as well as we can. So the pH and you know, the ionic strength is, um, well, the pH is meant to mimic the, the uh, concentration in the cells. At this point, um, it doesn't have a lot of, uh, you know, it just has charge balance. It doesn't have a lot of uh, specific ions in there. And that, you know, that is another level of detail that, that could be explored. Um, I suspect that ultimately you're using the simulations to sort of guide what you're going to do. And then um, ultimately you'll be doing the real experiments to sort of see what happens. Um, so, so just for clarity, I assume that that's ultimately going to be the test as opposed to simulations where they're sort of guiding your. your oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, remember we started, we started working on this on March 15th. So, you know, we, we have, we actually have a lot of results already. We do have some things in the lab, but we need those simulations to make sure that we do smart experiments. We don't want to just try every random thing in the world because we'll waste our time and, and resources. Um, you know, some, some people have tried that random screening approach, and I'm not saying that it's a waste of time. It's worth trying, but we don't need to do it too, given that other people have already done that. We, we want to take a, a more targeted approach. And so the things that we have done in the lab so far have focused on developing tools that we know we're definitely going to need. So for instance, making that fluorescent assay, making the positive control, and just making a lot of the protein and characterizing it. So be looking for updates down the road once we, you know, use the simulations to plan our, our inhibitor design and, and get some real hits moving. Um, so a couple of very quick questions since we're running out of time. Um, one is people are asking, what does this mean, text PSBLS241444 to give? What does that mean? Uh, so what that means is you go to your phone to the text box and in where you would type the number, you type 41444. And in the in the actual text that the you you type the letters P S B L S. When you do that, it'll send you back a link that then you can go to UCI and and do a formal give. So that's how that will work. So if you do that text, you're still not giving up money. You 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 won't actually be giving until you then follow the subsequent link that it sends to you. Um, one question was um, uh, can you give us a time frame, say best case scenario, how soon uh, would you be able to think develop something that would be starting to be used um, in, to fight this disease? So it's hard to be able to give an exact time frame just because we're at such an early stage. Part of that depends on what we find in terms of the, you know, the actual compounds that we're looking at. So I mentioned that we are screening things from drug bank. We're looking at, at drugs that are already FDA approved. If we find something that is FDA approved or generally recognized as safe, like say a plant compound that, that people know is safe to consume, then you know, assuming we can find a collaborator at the med school, that could go into clinical trials very quickly. If we have to use one of the things that we're designing from scratch, 
that's a longer term effort. But the hope here is that we can get some of that done, especially if we can find an existing drug to use, much faster than the development of, of a vaccine, which we know is going to take about 18 months. Of course, the vaccine is what we really need to get out of this. Um, and a lot of really smart people are working on that. The, the point of antiviral drugs is just to reduce the, int the intensity of the symptoms. So people would still get sick, but hopefully in a much more mild form, and it would be able to keep people out of the hospital and let them recover on their own. Thanks. We have a fairly general question, and but it might be worth answering. And um, so there's a lot of discussion right now about COVID-19 vaccines that are being evaluated in trials. Um, describe what you're doing here and how it's different than a vaccine. Um, this is a treatment, right? So maybe, maybe describe that just big picture a little bit. Yeah, so a vaccine is, um, you know, it's either an inactivated version of the virus or it's a, it's a little part of the virus that primes your immune system to say, hey, this is something bad, we need to mobilize to fight it. And that's what we really need to make sure to get everybody protected from the disease. What we're doing here is more of a stopgap measure. So, that, so an antiviral drug, how that works is so the, the person has already been infected with the virus and you know, we're not able to prevent it with these agents. But if you, if you give the drug to somebody soon after infection, they can slow down the viral replication and make it so that the symptoms are milder Hopefully they don't have to go to the hospital. Hopefully they're not in as much danger. And so, so that's, that's the difference. The trade-off is a vaccine would be better, but we think we can do this faster. And then of course, um, there, are, there are always people who are immunocompromised and can't be vaccinated for various reasons. And it's very useful to have the antiviral agents in the toolbox for those people. Uh, we've heard a lot about remdesivir in the news recently and, and success. How does, how, how does this approach differ from, from that? Okay, so remdesivir takes a completely different approach in terms of the, the molecular biology. So that inhibits the, um, the RNA polymerase that copies the genetic code of the virus. And, you know, I have a couple things to say about that. One is that, you know, that study with remdesivir is promising and there, there are some improved outcomes, but it really isn't perfect. So for instance, it didn't have a significant effect on the mortality rate. So we're not out of the woods yet. That, you know, it's promising. It's great that people are, are working on these things, but we need more than one drug and we need to explore different strategies. Also, as I mentioned with mutation, we want to ideally be able to hit the virus with a cocktail of things that work on different mechanisms. So you could imagine giving the patient remdesivir and a protease inhibitor, and that would work better than either alone because now it's more difficult for the virus to develop mutation to, or to, to develop resistance to two drugs at once. Great. Um, so, you know, we are unfortunately out of time um, and we have a tremendous number of questions here that we haven't gotten to, but we might try to capture those and, and answer them in text somehow on a website when we post this. Um, but, you know, I think given the number of questions we have, that sort of says that you've, you've definitely gotten people interested in this subject. And I, and I hope, very much hope that the people who've tuned in got a lot out of this. I certainly did. Rachel, I know that you are busy submitting grants and doing research and organizing this humongous research effort. Um, and so I can't thank you enough for taking an hour out of your day and the prep time to put this talk together. Uh, it's very valuable. Thank you so much for doing it. And uh, I think I can speak to, for everyone on this, on this call, uh, a lot of people have said this in the question section that the best of luck to you. Um, and and we, all, we all wish you great success. Thank you, James, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Okay. Um, I think everyone who's on will get an email that we can link uh, with. A, we're going to post the talk again. We'll put the slides up, and we'll try to provide as much information as possible that way. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Rachel. Bye-bye.